Thanks everyone for coming. I'm Will Landau and I work in life sciences and I'm a, I'm a statistician and software developer. I develop capabilities, models and tools for other clinical statisticians. And one of the packages, one of the open source packages I've developed is called Targets. In the life sciences, we encounter a lot of large statistical computation for, from Bayesian data analysis, which is a lot of what I do. I'm a Bayesian statistician by training. We run a lot of models. We develop our, a lot of our own models and we need to test and validate them and apply them to our, to our data. And there are a lot of other tasks in the life sciences in including Bayesian network meta-analysis, as well as a whole bunch of different areas of machine learning, like uh, predictive modeling and, and subgroup identification. Uh, there are also other, other domains like PKPD and clinical trial simulation, and even ETL workflows that require a lot of, a lot of horsepower when it comes to, and a lot of runtime when it comes to accomplishing the, the original goals of the data analysis and um, so things like Markov chain Monte Carlo and, and uh, fitting a deep neural net and, and other sorts of similar tasks can take a really long time. And that gets compounded by changes that you would need to make that you need to make to your to your code. It's almost never the case that you would run a data analysis once and then just be done with it uh, from, from then on. They're, they're almost always changes to the upstream data, bug fixes to the code, new questions to investigate. And all these things require revisiting the code and at least running part of it. And the, the general practice is, is still to just run the entire thing from start to finish and each time a change is required. And so we're in a situation where if, if that's the case, we're never really done running the code and we get stuck in a Sisyphean loop where the results don't have a chance to catch up to the underlying code and data. To see how some of this works, we can break down its typical, a typical data analysis workflow. If, you, if you're familiar with the tidyverse in R, then you're familiar with with how this, how this graph represents a typical workflow where we begin with a data set, we tidy and transform it to get ready to apply our models. We apply those models, which usually take most of the runtime, but not all. We, and then we post-process to produce tables, figures, graphs, reports that are humanly read readable and we can share with our colleagues and, and externally. During the course of a project, you'll probably want to make changes to, to parts of it. And if you change, for example, the model, then everything that depends on it is no longer valid. And all these components require updates to synchronize with the upstream code and data and get the latest results. And there is that leaves the human running the project with a choice to rerun all the models and take potentially hours and hours of runtime in response to a very small change, or to try to figure out which components of the data analysis really need attention and to try to, to guess at, okay, will this, will this model change? And so that means that the, the, the post-processing figures and tables for that model changed. And that requires a lot of micromanaging to go back and figure out what pieces of the analysis you need to rerun. That's not something a human does well. And that's the sort of, that, that lends to, to, this, to this, the kind of human subjectivity and human error that undermines reproducibility for the, for the same reasons that we criticize Microsoft Excel for, for being this, this interface where we point and click to edit the code, uh, sorry, edit the, edit the data and to not have a, a reproducible trail in code this business of picking and choosing what to, what to rerun and its statistical analysis workflow suffers the same kind of reproducibility concerns. This need not be a, a dichotomy. So this, this false dichotomy is resolved with pipeline tools. So 
especially make like pipeline tools after the, the, the uh, utility GNU make. And what a pipeline tool does is it arranges the specific steps of your pipeline, which are called targets. Each of these is a target conceptually in a directed acyclic graph. And I've written this one from left to right, beginning with your, your data and ending with your plots and reports and with models in between. And what a pipeline tool does is it automatically figures out how the work it needs to do is, is connected to those steps are, or targets are connected to each other. It runs, it runs the, the parts that need to run with optional parallel or distributed computing and it automatically skips the models that are already up to date, the targets that are already up to date in order to save time. And it just runs what needs to run, it saves a lot of computation time that way. And also, even if, it, even if you're running something that doesn't require a whole lot of time, this graph gives you a really nice high level view of what's going on in your workflow. And you can share a graph like this to collaborators, or if you left the project for six months and just decided to move on to other things. And all of a sudden you need to resurrect this, this old project suit to answer some new questions that came up. You can immediately go to this graph, remember what this project is all about and remember what data objects that you need to, to read back in or inspect in order to refresh your memory and then go about competently making the, the changes you need to make. And in this example, this is a mock example where we're just testing three different models and we're supposing that, hey, the deep neural net's already up to date, but our Bayesian model random forest, maybe we change the code for those models. Maybe we change the R functions that we wrote in order to support those models. And these, these targets are, are outdated and so is, and everything downstream is, is uh, suspect as well. So there are a lot of pipeline tools out there. There are, there are a few hundred and they're, some of the most popular ones are listed here. It's a really sophisticated, mature space overall. But most of these tools are designed for Python or they're designed to be language agnostic to, to interact with in the, in the Linux shell or, or something similar. And this, this language agnosticism, it covers, it covers a lot of users, but there are reasons why it's why we need an R focused pipeline tool as well. There's, there's just so much computationally expensive data analysis that happens in R. We really needed an R focused pipeline tool. The first one to my knowledge that was, was like this and met, met this set of needs is a tool called Remake by Rich Fitzjohn. He developed this, this package in around 2014 uh, developed it for a couple of years and then had to abandon it because his job changed. And towards the tail end of his of his uh, time maintaining that package, you know, I became really interested and I developed a package called Drake to to continue that work. Um, write some different ideas about about templating and parallel processing that I wanted to implement that would be easier in a in a new package. And now targets is what we have today, which is which is another package that I wrote to overcome the what I learned to developing Drake and what I learned in terms of how to, how to overcome Drake's permanent, implementa permanent limitations. So targets, unlike other pipeline tools, is fundamentally designed for R. You can work, you can, you can feel like you're working within an R session. I mean, even though it, it subtly and discreetly spawns different R processes depending on on its needs and depending on your preferences for parallel computing, it looks and feels like you're in an R session. It looks and feels like you're working with R objects instead of files. There, I, there's, you know, each step has some data to save. What one of the things Target does is it abstracts files as R objects. So, so a lot, a lot of this micromanagement of a typical data analysis is taken away. Not only that, perhaps one of the most important things is that it supports a function-oriented style of programming that's clean and modular and idiomatic to R. So you're, it encourages good R programming practices that, that do really well at scale. And what that means is we get away from a numbered script approach. We, we get a, By using functions, we get away from this approach where we have to 
define every task as a separate R script and manually load files and manually save files. That's that gets cumbersome at scale and it gets difficult to maintain, especially if you like these numbered prefixes. The one these these don't respond well under changes. You'll have to you'll have to update the numbers and the the imperative programming means it's it's a bit unclear what your inputs and outputs are and and the way that the things kind of blend together. Um, I know this pattern is recommended still in the R community, but for for really computationally intense tasks. Um, or even ones that you want to be super clear and super reproducible, it has trouble scaling. So I'm going to encourage functions. Um, if this R has such 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 dominant roots in function oriented programming, um, I mean back to John Chambers, the creator of S, um, famously said this. And what what I'm encouraging is to write. I mean, everything you do is a, is a function, meaning it has explicit arguments and a single return value and ideally no side effects. And to express a data analysis this way, it, it has all sorts of reproducibility benefits and it encapsulates what's going on in a data analysis. You know, a data analysis is a sequence of, of transformations, one to the other. There are explicit inputs and explicit outputs and each act of analyzing your data or doing a, a task is transforming one thing into another. Functions capture that very nicely. Um, the workflow that we're, that we're going to use is, um, and, to, to bef and so that's sort of some, some general background. We're gonna apply these concepts and we're gonna start using targets on this example machine learning workflow from Matt Dancho's 2018 our Studio AI blog post. This is a blog post that came out right around the time that the Keras R package and TensorFlow R package came out to demonstrate this new machine learning functionality in R. And it's a great use case, and even especially pedagogically, and it generalizes across fields. And so that's what we'll use today. This is, this is the workflow that we're going to build up in terms of a collection of functions and get to know targets. So, um, we're going to we're going to take this IBM customer churn data set, this telco customer churn data set. It has information on individual customers, DA identified, of course, and it it has information about whether whether or not they they continued with or canceled their subscription over a six month period, and it has more subscription and demographic data as well on them. And I know this is a life sciences oriented conference, but but there, there are things I can mention later on that are a bit more overtly specific to the life sciences. This example and this archetype generalizes. The workflow principles that you learn will generalize. So how we do this. So like I said, we're going to embrace functions. And start, starting at the data preparation stage. So we're going to, to read in a, our data file, split it into a training and test set. We have another function that generates a tidy models recipe to pre-process the data from just a, a clean split data frame into a, an object where we can extract arrays and vectors to apply directly to the Keras model. So this takes tidy data, converts it into some data that a Keras model can accept, a, a deep neural net. Likewise, we have, we have functions to split up the various components of what we're doing when we, when we actually apply the model. So we have a function just to encapsulate the model definition, just to train the model, and then we, and, and just to compute the classification accuracy. And then we have a, a couple of wrappers to make, to make it working with these previous functions easier in a practical setting. So functions, typically you would write a function in three different scenarios, either your you're preparing a data set, either by simulation or, or just procuring one, or you're fitting a model, or you're summarizing the results of a model. And those three situations are the majority of use cases for what you would write functions for in a, in a data analysis. And then, and then you can split up those functions into helpers, and you can aggregate those in wrapper functions to encapsulate specific ideas. And the, the whole point is to create custom shorthand that makes your code easier to read and easier to understand. 
rather than having to recapitulate the entire model definition in an imperative script, I can just call define model and it encapsulates this. And this is part of the purest mentality, the purest mentality of that code is meant to be meant to be read more than executed. And that, that helps a lot with transparency and reproducibility. Now, all this style of, of th this function oriented style can generalize beyond targets, or I include it here for, for that reason. And because it makes targets a whole lot easier to use. This is, this is the programming style that, that targets nudges you to do. Uh, you can put those, all those functions in whatever scripts you want, however you want. Uh, targets doesn't have an opinion about how you save your functions in R scripts, but it does, it does uh, expect that you will have some way of loading them. And I just put all this, these functions in a file called functions.r. You would split them up over different, over different uh, scripts if you like. It doesn't really matter as long as you load them in, in the proper place. The only file that's really required is this special file called underscore targets.r. And you can rename this with some configuration, but most for most workflows, it's it's this target script that is going to allow you to define a targets pipeline. And how this works in our targets file, which is part of what makes targets targets, is it loads all the, the functions and 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 settings and it loads the packages required to define the, the pipeline. And then it ends with a pipeline definition. And so what you're seeing here at the bottom and every target script has to end like this is a list of objects that define what the targets are. So we have a target to track the data file for changes. We have another target to apply our split data function to, to read the data it's split into training and test. We have a we have a third target to create a recipe object to get the data ready for our deep neural net. And each of these targets has a name, which is the first argument and a command, which is just an R expression as the, as the second argument. And these are just skippable steps in the workflow. Each target is a skippable step that's connected to other skippable steps. It loads the dependencies, the, the upstream targets. It does some task. And, it, and then it saves some data and the saving of the data is completely abstracted away. So using, so one of the things targets does is it analyzes your code statically for dependency relationships. So it will know that you mentioned the symbol churn data inside the churn recipe target. And so there's this dependency relationship. And likewise, there's a dependency on prepare recipe because this symbol is here. And so what targets does is internally, it arranges these steps in a directed acyclic graph where the dependencies among functions and among targets are clearly laid out. So churn recipe depends on churn data, not because it's listed later, but because it mentions, it uses this churn data target upstream. And so, and so I could have reordered the code, reordered the functions, reordered the targets, and it would still produce the same graph. And you can view this graph as, as the user, and it helps even in a small computation scenario to get a high level, higher level view of, of what's happening. When, to, when you want to run the analysis, you can use a function called tar make. There are also parallel computing versions of tar make using, using packages cluster MQ in future. That's a bit beyond the scope of this workshop, but parallel computing is available. Distributed computing is available if you have a cluster access to one. But for now, tar make is what we're going to use to actually run the pipeline. So what it does is it runs the correct targets in the correct order, tells, tells you what it's doing, and it stores the results in a data store. And the data store is just a targets folder in the workspace of your project. And there's there are convenient functions tar load and tar read to bring the data back into your environment so you can inspect it for problems. And at this point, I usually start a pipeline using a small number of targets and then run them and inspect them. And because up-to-date targets are skipped, there's very little cost to repeating the pipeline, to repeating tar make. So we're gonna build up this pipeline gradually. And, and very soon you'll have interactive exercises in a cloud workspace in order to do that. But for now, I'm going to preview what we're doing. So 
we wrote some more functions to fit models, to fit deep neural nets. And we're going to fit two different ones with two slightly different deep neural net architectures. And these two targets will immediately appear as outdated because we haven't run them yet. And they will appear in the graph and they'll depend on the functions that are, that, that are required to call them. And they'll also depend on the targets that they use, the upstream data. When we run tar make, it's going to skip the targets that we already made, that we already ran. And if, we, if, if there were no changes to the upstream code and data, but it'll run the new or outdated targets like our models. When we read those models back in, we see that we achieved about 80% accuracy on each one. And we, we also chose to save the architecture of the models. This is an experimentation phase, this part of the, of the pipeline. We're, we're experimenting with different architectures and seeing how good we can get accuracy. This is a bit experimental. It requires running the pipeline very often on different targets. And we may end up with hundreds or even thousands of models. And we don't want to save all those model objects because we don't want to overburden storage on our local machine. So we write custom code just to save the accuracy and information about the architecture of our of of the the models that we're experimenting with and we've we've reproducibly kept track of what experiments we've already done and so this 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 turns out to be sort of in the midst of this exploratory process of trying to tune a model we've we've rec reproducibly recorded things we've already done so we know what we've tried and the where models that we can go back to we also add a couple targets just for convenience to find the best model out of the ones we've already run and to actually hold on to the model object of the highest accuracy model. So this retrain run function run, it does the same thing as, as our other model fits, but it returns the actual model object. And this, this might be the, the model that we want to deploy to production if, if we you know, have, the, have the model object, we upload it somewhere, we put, a, put an API around it that can accept uh, prediction requests. That's, that, might be, that might be a thing that we use on this model object that's returned at the end. And as before, only the new targets rerun and everything else is skipped, including these potentially expensive model runs that we already did. And as for changes, if you change the R code that you use or we, if we add a new model, um, we, have a, we have a change to code here. We have an upstream, a new model here. If we add those new targets, then the workflow will adapt. Those, the affected targets downstream, that model run and what comes after will be, will be listed as outdated. And only those bits of the computation will run. Notice we skipped best model here because because the, the, the accuracy of the run sigmoid model wasn't any better than the previous two. If we change a function, then targets will react as well. So if we, if we change the architecture of, of our model in this define model function, what happens is that this model is pretty upstream in the dependency structure. And so this targets knows this function changed. And so that invalidates all the functions that call it because those are going to produce different results now because the upstream functions changed. And likewise with the targets that call those, those downstream functions and all the targets downstream of that are also suspect. And so uh, what, what happens is that in, in, this, in this scenario, uh, that invalidates all of, sorry, that, that, uh, that's going to in, Actually, I, I, yeah, here's, here's the slide that I wanted. Yeah, it's going to invalidate all the models, but not any of the data. And so if our, pre if our data pre-processing pre steps are expensive, then, then that will save us time. Similarly, if the data file changes, and I'll teach you how to do this, the, you can set up targets to react to changes in data files so that it'll invalidate everything that it needs to that depends on that data. And at the end of the day, if everything is up to date, then you have tangible evidence of reproducibility. You have tangible evidence that all of your current results match the code and data that you have now, where those results are supposed, supposed to come from. And this, this is such an important piece of reproducibility. You know, in other areas, you'll find, you'll find that, that people, people assert that 
that reproducibility is synonymous with literate programming, like like Knitter and R Markdown in the in the R ecosystem. I'm claiming here that's not the full story. That's not entirely what it means for a workflow to be reproducible, especially with these large computations that happen so much, especially in they're doing babies and data analysis or machine learning or even ETL workflows that take a long time. This is an important piece of reproducibility too. And it's what a pipeline tool can give you. There are a lot of resources and targets. So there is there, there is a there's example code for this specific example, as well as a, an R Studio Cloud workspace. These slides and the materials of this, of this whole short course are also available in public. Targets itself has a lot of resources. There is a development repository and there's a discussion forum on in, in targets where you can post, post discussion topics, ask questions, and I'll be there to answer them. It also has a full user manual walking through in-depth topics, as well as a reference website. And at this point, I will just point out the reference website. So this gives an overview of targets. And if you want to get started, or if it's you know, been a while since you've you've attended this workshop, or or you want to go back and start from the beginning, or refer your colleagues to this, I recommend starting here. It'll, it'll take an intermediate R user maybe about one or two hours to go through the first three bullet points here. And that'll, that'll get people over the initial hurdle to get started. And there's, there's a lot more to continue with. There's a lot of features. The functions, the function references here, there, there are a lot of utilities that can make it easier to work with targets to, for example, monitor the progress of a pipeline to use parallel computing and customize the, the workflow to, to work out specific, specific um, needs. And for this workshop, before we go to the RStudio Cloud workspace of the exercises, I'd be happy to take a round of questions first, but I'll just say that my goals for this workshop are to orient intermediate R users who may or may not be familiar with, with custom functions to this function-oriented style of, of creating a workflow and, and to go from there to develop a, a targets pipeline and to experience hands-on what targets can do for you in terms of managing a workflow efficiently and cleanly. And it's, it's very hands-on. It's, it's, um, I'm not trying to expose you to everything here. I'm just trying to narrow in on some, on some key concepts here. And depending on people's experience level and comfort level, we may go a little faster to the more advanced topics, but this workshop is designed to get you over the hurdle of, of using targets, understanding what it's for and how to use it. And with that, I'll take questions and I am just looking at the, at the chat. There are some links. Thanks for, for posting those links. Are the, if there are any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or to just unmute yourself if you have that capability and, and ask them. Um, don't be, never be afraid to unmute yourself and ask. This is, this, this is a, I mean, we've, we're done with the seminar portion. This, is, uh, this can be as interactive and hands-on and informal as, as uh, you all are comfortable with. So I'll, I'll come in with a, um, a quick question. Um, we're seeing that, I mean, there's some great examples here of using targets for um, ensuring that we have these complex pipelines um, where things take a long time to run. Um, is it also a, a good tool to use for things that are, you know, take seconds to run and um, yeah, just more simple things, perhaps like just a, an R markdown report where we've got a few little things to get from a website and from a SQL database, but all of it only takes a split second to run. So there are still benefits. It's not really what the full power of the tool is designed to tackle, but there are benefits to doing so. 
it's it makes it forces you to be very clear about what your inputs and outputs are. It makes it very very extensible as well. It's it avoids it avoids having a mess, and it it makes it easier to 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 share with the the results with with colleagues and and you know if you have a, a lot of targets or a lot of data objects in a workflow it's it just makes it easier to keep to keep an eye on everything and to stay transparent and reproducible um, people like it, miles mcbain and matt dre in the community have have argued that point and they've used they've used it for workflows like uh like this and they're they, they're some of the most vocal people who who use it that way great thanks um i mean matt dre is um some of the some of us may have come across because he works in the UK's government data services. So um yes, yeah, great to see that it's been used for perhaps you know more naughty kinds of workflows, um, more general day-to-day -day stuff. Um that's been another question just posted in the chat, so I'll just read it out um to you. Um do you need to separate each target um, actions into its own script for this to work? Or do they do they just need to be separated into functions? Yeah, so how you organize your R scripts is entirely up to you. The targets and functions could be all in the same script, or you could divide them into different scripts. It's it's entirely up to you. And in fact, there's a there's actually a system called target markdown where you don't have to worry about either, which uh, there's a there's a and I'll, I'll demo it at the at when we get to the that sweet spot in the in the exercises and which and what what's great about target markdown is you can just put functions and targets into code chunks in the report and the the a special language engine will actually write those scripts for you so you don't have to worry about those issues but yeah it's you you have complete freedom what really matters for using targets is how you construct your target script so you could write your functions in targets.r in line here you could write them all here you could write different you could as long as you source those functions into the script or just or or evaluate that code somehow to put the the functions in your environment inside this target script file that will that will be that will be sufficient no matter where those the where that code actually is is stored and in terms of individual targets you could have all the targets themselves all the target definitions themselves at the bottom of this script or you could you could define this target list in another script and just include it at the bottom of this targets.r file right here. So you have complete freedom and flexibility to organize your, your pipeline. Um, it's just that the, the functions, however you write them, they just need to be included in the environment if you, if you run this target script and all the target definitions need to be in some sort of list structure at the very end. Any other questions? So at this point, I think we can go to the cloud workspace. Um, and just, quickly, just have yeah. one more question just come in. Um, right, mm -hmm. <laughs> right as we start to yeah. the situation. <laughs> uh, would it be tricky to convert an existing set of analyses to use targets? I think that's a great question. I've got plenty it is of a great <laughs> that could benefit from this. It is a great question. And it's the answer is it depends. If you have, it depends on how how far along you are in the analysis. It depends on how function oriented the code is. And it depends on, yeah, I think those are the those are the big ones. There's if your code isn't already oriented around functions and you don't have a sort of run everything script that's that's concise and ties everything all together if you're if your workflow it, it and if you're and if your code doesn't respect sort of the, the purity of having inputs and outputs and if it relies on side effects then then it could take a lot of refactoring to convert an existing workflow to targets but if you already write functions if you already modular if you're already if you're already resisting side effects and working with return values of those functions then then it will be straightforward and all you need is a targets file with with a few target definitions to break your workflow down into into 
savable, skippable steps. So most people, when they've gone to, to targets, it's, it's, it's usually in a, in a fresh project. Uh, but but there have certainly been people who've con- made the conversion, but it's it's very manual. There's no way to to really automate it reliably. And um, yeah, that's that's what I would recommend. And each each use case would need to be evaluated. Um, but but there is is still a way to get to targets one way or another. All right, uh, shall we continue? Great. So let's go to the cloud workspace. Hopefully you had time to sign up for a free account at rstudio.cloud. You can log in. You should have been able to use your, your Google or, or GitHub account to, to log in or, or just uh, set up a new set of credentials. When you log in, you should see a space like this, maybe not as populated as this one, but with projects in the middle and workspaces on the upper left. And what I'd like everyone to do once they're logged in is to click on the NHS Conf 21 targets workspace over here on the left. And you should see, oh, oh, this list is quite longer than it than it used to be, which is great. It means a lot of you have, have signed up. So what I'd like you to do is, is click there and you should see an assignment called Targets Tutorial. And if you would click on that, that'll take you to a new page that should look like this with the workspaces on the left and an RStudio IDE window in the middle. So there is one comment that says that they couldn't join. And they have logged. They've logged in. Um, yeah, if we'd be we'd be happy to help you if you're having trouble logging into our Studio Cloud. Um, and we do have time. This is this is. Um, I mean, especially especially at this beginning stage. If you would if you would DM the NHSR team, then um, then then. We can, we can troubleshoot that. But for everybody else, if you would log into the one dash functions, uh, if, you, if you would log into the workspace and open the, and, and make sure that you have, the, have some, some panels open here, look for the files panel and, um, and it, it might be in the lower right like mine or it might be in a different quadrant. But if you look here and you go down to one dash functions dot R, that's going to be one of a few different notebooks with with exercises that we're going to go over today. Um, this we're, we're going to start off really slowly, and so this this notebook is just to get you familiar with with the data analysis workflow that we are going to convert to targets. So there we have the machine learning workflow I described in the slides. We have a few different functions to describe what's in it. We have functions split data and prepare recipe for the for the data, data processing. We have define model to do what to do what, exactly what it sounds like. We have train model to run that model on the training data, and so on. And so, what I'd like you to do is to go through each of the code chunks, run them, experiment with them, experiment with the functions, get familiar with how they how they work and how they run and what they return. And notice that they take explicit inputs. They they return a value in memory in R. They don't they don't attempt to save any files themselves, and they don't produce any side effects. And this is good practice when writing functions. And by side effect, I mean something that's not related to a return value. Maybe it changes something in the global environment, or saves a file, or or that sort of thing. All we want a function to do is generate something in its local environment and return a value. And this is these th- this notebook describes how to how to express a workflow and that kind of system of pure functions. And so you can you can run these code chunks by clicking the play button on the upper right, this green triangle, and it'll go through and it'll load all of the 
all of the the packages. I'm you know I'm actually gonna gonna run this on my on a my local R Studio IDE so I don't I don't ruin the assignment for everyone. But it's it's the it's the same thing. You can press the the green play button. You can. You can, and then you can go through the rest of the of the of the of the code chunks to, for example, load the load the functions one by one into memory and then try them out. So, for example, the split data function uses the uh, R sample package to split a data frame into training and test. If we look at this churn data set, it's going to say, okay, this is a special object split into uh, some number of of testing and training rows and we can use the functions training and testing to to extract how many how many uh do extract the actual data frames that we'll be using likewise for prepare recipe so what we're doing here is creating a tidy models recipe object by by acting on the training data defining our response variable and predictors and then we're going to do some pre-processing steps. We're not going to model customer ID. We're going to remove the rows with, with any missing values. We're going to discretize and log scale a couple of couple of predictors. And we're going to we're going to turn yes no's into, into ones and zeros. And then we're going to we're going to take categorical variables, turn them into zero one variables. And then we're going to center and scale all the variables, including those binary ones. And that will be, and then the prep function says actually run these steps instead of just adding them to the recipe specification. And that'll be, that'll be a recipe object. So if we run this function and then we run the recipe, this is a prepared recipe object. And we can use the juice function aptly named to, to return the pre-processed training data. And then the bake function does the same thing with the testing data. And we'll use that to compute classification error on, on the, the test set. Those are our test, testing accuracy. Um, and then, and then the, the notebook goes, goes on and I'll, I'll, um, I'll stop there and give everybody 15 minutes to work on this, um, this initial portion, and then write it a little after, uh, after the hour, we'll take our first break. We'll take breaks on the hour, every hour for the remainder of the workshop after that. So, so I would take, take 15 minutes to, to familiarize yourself with, with this. I will put a timer up and we will, uh, feel free to ask me ask me questions in the chat. We can use this. Other others who are having trouble accessing the cloud workspace can use that time as well. After those fifteen minutes, we'll take our first ten minute break. I'll come back. I'll go over the rest of the notebook, and then we can move on to the other exercises. Okay, uh, we have uh, somebody else dropping off. Um, yeah, thanks for attending this first piece. And like uh, like I said before, there's the, this, these materials are available through those links if you want to continue. So this first notebook was just about familiarizing yourself with the with the functions that that are part of this of this deep learning workflow that we are about to turn into a targets project. So going over these functions for the data, we start with start with the upstream data. Uh, before that, the package is actually, but once we get to the data, we have a function to split the data into training and test. And we run the function, we get this split data object. We use training and testing to view the training and testing data sets respectively. So <clears throat> in this data set, we have a bunch of demographic variables like gender and, and age and, and other demographic variables. We also have some variables that show phone subscription status, for example, that are relevant to you know, who drops out and who doesn't. And a response variable is customer churn, basically who keeps their subscription and who doesn't to this telecom company. And we want to train some predictive models based on 
based they can they can accurately classify new customers that that are we may see in the future whether they're going to to continue or or not and these might be this might be a tool in in the sort of marketing efforts of this company but even if you're not looking to 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 do this kind of business oriented task there's plenty of other way way applications and data analyses and life sciences that that follow this general pattern of data to models to, to summaries so uh, continuing on the prepare recipe function that that produces a tidy models recipe really convenient concise and reliable way to specify and run a bunch of pre-processing steps on your data to get it ready for it, the the Keras model and in in this case and or just pre-process other data sets for other applications very easily as well. And we get, uh, we, we can call juice, like I said, to, to view the training set and bake to view a new testing data set that was not part of the recipe pre-processing initially. So now we're going to the models. This define model function is some Keras syntax for specifying the architecture of a deep neural net. This is this is a a deep neural net for our predictive models. It has what are called layers of 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 neurons. They have to specify to what kind of models we have. There are there are a whole bunch of tuning param parameters that we could pick. And for the purposes of this exercise, we can argue, we can modify the size of the first two layers. So these these units variables, number of number of quote neurons, um, as well as the what are called activation functions. These these simple uh, one to one transformations on um, on on each of the neurons. And and I realize I'm glossing over a lot of information here. Um, I'm using deep learning, but this is not. This this itself is not a deep learning course, but there are plenty of resources to learn about how how this all works. Uh, various materials, including one or two books, linked from the the Keras package documentation, and maybe later on you could check it out. To when we run this function, we get a model definition object. It's a special Keras package object that. Uh, that's represented like this shows the architecture of the, of our model. We define another function to fit that model to the data, and this function is a bit more concise because we it calls define model uh, to produce the definition of the model, and it compiles the model, gets the data ready, and then fits that model and returns it. So if we run that, this is a small model and a small data set, but it already takes it already takes a bit of time. It's long enough to certainly feel, and it's long enough to, if you're iterating over and over this workflow, you would want to skip this long computation, um, even though it's even not, not even that long, um, in order to save time and to iterate through your workflow a bit quicker. Um, this function test accuracy just takes a fitted model and it takes the testing data using the recipe and it uses the yardstick package to compute testing accuracy and also to um, yeah, to compute testing accuracy. And then test model sort of wraps that all together and computes the testing accuracy and also returns the details about the architecture next to the, the classification accuracy on the testing data. And so we know result, you know the, the, the inputs that we gave that function, this little data frame it is, is a synopsis of, of one little experiment on a deep neural net. And we want to find the, in the, the right values for these tuning parameters here that maximize accuracy. Now, I, I realize I'm, I'm glossing over a lot. We want to take, also take measures to avoid overfitting. We also want to do some sort of cross-validation to, to you know, help with that. But I mean, these are, these are simplifications that, that I'm sort of glossing over for the, for, for the purpose of getting to targets quickly and for, for pedagogical simplicity. Um, likewise, the retrain run function takes one of these data frames and it, well, takes, takes a bunch of inputs that you can get from these data frames and 
it, it takes a, a recipe object and it then it it um, it runs the yeah it then it then it runs that model and returns a fitted model object for a model we actually care about. All right, um, feel free to ask any questions uh, on on this part going forward. We're going to switch gears a little bit here and actually use targets for the first time. So let's all go to this two dash pipelines.rmd notebook. And what this is gonna do is it's going to gradually build up a targets pipeline using the functions that we already defined. So uh, we'll, and, and again, we'll start by running each of the code chunks. There, there are places where you'll write code, little bits of code, and then see how targets behaves in response. So um, to go through line by line, uh, chunk by chunk, we will create a fresh workspace. We will, um, and then then we'll begin by anchoring on what this would this workflow would look like without targets. So if we were to run this whole workflow without targets, you'd you'd load the packages, you'd load the functions, you'd establish the data set, and then you would call the functions to execute various steps of the workflow. To put this into a targets framework we want each of these three lines to be its own target. And the beginning part of this notebook walks through how to do that. First, we need a targets file. And if you run this script, you'll get one in your workspace, in your file space. So if I run this chunk and I go to the targets file, this is what we'll see. You'll have, you'll have the, the targets package itself loaded. You'll source the functions. You'll declare the packages that the targets will need. And then you declare the definitions of the targets for data processing that we have so far. And so what that, and by the way, these functions in two dash pipelines, these are the functions that you spent a few minutes going over. And they, these are, this is the actual code for each of the functions, nice and condensed and concise, along with some Roxygen 2 documentation explaining the inputs and outputs and, and along with examples of, of how to run them as well. And so with that set up, you can actually call tar edit to, to open the file in our studio, to open the targets file. You're going to be iterating on that. And what I'd, I'd like you to do is experiment with this targets file, experiment with, with a couple of things you can do with it. So for example, you can show the dependency graph. This automatically looks for the targets file in the current working directory and shows the dependency graph. Um, tar glimpse and tar viz network allow you to do that. And this graph is interactive. So you can zoom in by scrolling. You can zoom out. You can click and drag the whole graph. You can click and drag each node up and down to, to improve the view. And you have a legend on the right, which for more interesting graphs will become more, more informative. And there is, and then, and then you can run the pipeline. You can run tar make and it will run it will load the packages. It's, it's a bit slow because it's starting initializing the session, building, uh, loading the packages. And then it builds the correct targets in the correct order. And you'll be able to load each of the targets and you'll be able to check that they're, that they're set up correctly. After that, you're going to follow these instructions to add to the pipeline. You're going to take statements that looked like this and then in the targets file, you're going to turn these into actual target objects. And then after that, you're going to you're going to see sort of how will this viz network graph respond. So here's what it looks like without those targets. And if you did if you did the the setup correctly, what you're going to see is model objects connected to the recipe object in the data uh, downstream of these initial targets. Once you once you add them to the targets file. And then you can go through running the pipeline with tar make, inspecting it with, with tar viz network, reading the objects in with tar read, and then, and then repeating. And this, this notebook builds up the rest of the pipeline from there. And what I'd like to do is leave you all with 15 minutes to start with, with going through this notebook. Um, so I'll put, the, I'll put 15 minutes on the clock. And we can get started. If you need, I'll check in at 10 minutes. We can add time. We can move faster if everybody's already passed. 
Um, so yeah, let's just go at your own pace. I will see what your pace is and, and adapt. Adding more, adding. So back to, back to this notebook, um, we, we are beginning our first targets workflow by adding some of the models that we've mentioned. So hopefully you got down to this section where we have two different model runs, one with each with a different deep neural net architecture. And we're going to turn these into target definitions. So we're going to go here in the target list. We could have put this, we could put these targets, by the way, anywhere, anywhere in this target list. Doesn't have to be the be doesn't have to be the end, could be the beginning. In fact, why don't I just stick this above all the targets in the target list? Really makes no difference. So these are these are imperative assignment statements. And all we need to do is just turn these into target definitions. And it's just a matter of calling the tar target function, giving each target a name, and including the R command, the R expression, that's going to run and return the value stored in here. Really stored in a data store, but we're gonna pretend that it's stored in an object by this name. So we're going to edit this file. Now when we show the viz network graph, Everything upstream of that is still up to date because I haven't changed anything. And then downstream, there are two targets that are listed as outdated because we haven't run them yet. And when we run them, it's just a matter of calling tar make. We begin with the first model. It takes some time. If you're using targets heavily, chances are most of your targets will take a long time to, well, a lot of your targets will take a long time to run. And that's it's the nature of just computationally demanding work. This is, this is part of the reason that targets even exists is because these workflows that would take a long time to run anyway, you wanna be able to skip steps that are already up to date. And so if I run this tar make again, it, it barely takes any time at all because it automatically knows how to skip these expensive models that you spent all that time running if everything is up to date. The graph also shows this, the graph, you don't have to run tar make in order to know what's up to date and what's out of date. You can run tar viz network to show the graph. You can run tar outdated just to get a, a list of targets that, that, that are outdated. So when it says character zero, that means that there, there are no targets that are out of date. Uh, everything is up to date. And that would be true if I, rearrange the target list. If I put these targets at the end, then the graph still shows the same pipeline with the same information. And that's because the execution order of these targets uses, relies on the symbols that you actually mention in your commands rather than any, any ordering in this target list. So the run ReLU target depends on churn data and churn recipe because these symbols are mentioned here, not because run ReLU is, is mentioned uh, later on. And in fact, if um, in some places you even have conditionally independent targets that can, run, that can run simultaneously. So if we were to activate parallel computing, which is supported in targets, then we could run run ReLU and run sigmoid at the same time. And the rest, of, the rest of this notebook is very similar. And if you got to the end, you will end up with a pipeline that looks like this. Are there any questions? There was one that I just had come through. Um, it's just more around the um, resource available on Studio Cloud. So I've just put a little um, message in for how to um, bump up the RAM if you need to. Um, the default is to have just one gigabyte of RAM, which might not be enough. Um, so um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you'll just have to back out the project and come back into it first to be able to see that. 
Yeah, you know, it used to be enough in previous times that I taught this workshop, but it's, uh, yeah, it may not be, it may not be enough for, for whatever reason. It could have been an update to Python, Keras, and TensorFlow. Um, not sure exactly what it is, but uh, you can increase the RAM by clicking this RAM button in the upper, upper right. That'll open the resources panel. You could also click the settings and then click resources and you'll get the RAM used and you can, you can adjust this slider. It'll prompt you to restart the project and then you'll be, you'll be all set. Yeah, if that option isn't immediately available, um, just back out and go back in. I should have set the settings so any member can do it. Um, but if not, message me and I should be able to log into your projects and I'll put back out. <laughs> yeah, thanks for doing that. So moving on to perhaps a more interesting part of the, of the workshop, our next notebook, you'll have some hands-on exercises to kick the tires, to, so to speak, to, uh, to begin with a fully specified pipeline, run it, and then, and then go back and make changes. changes, change the commands, change the functions, and uh, check your understanding of what's happening. And so there's this quiz structure to this notebook just to, just to guide you through. Uh, and what you'll do is you'll, you'll source the code chunks in order. You'll begin with a fresh project. That's what tar destroy does. It removes the, the data store. You'll begin with a different targets file. So run this code chunk and then press tar and, and then enter tar edit to open that file and make sure you have this target script that you see here. You're loading the function script from the three dash changes folder and the rest of the pipeline is already specified here. So up through till the end. And the rest of the, the notebooks are, the rest of the notebook is, is a bunch of exercises. Like, like I said, it's very, very self-directed. You'll have time to think about, about what we're, what's going on here. Um, so you'll see, um, you'll see these quiz questions. And if I run it and it doesn't have the right answer, it'll tell you. And if you do put the right answer in, it'll tell you that you're correct and, and you can move on. Um, and there, there are hints uh, throughout these answers give you. Um, and so I would encourage you to go through and set that up on your end and run the pipeline, go through these questions. Let me know if you have questions of your own and take some time to familiarize yourself with, with, how, with the behavior of targets Again, this is very hands-on guided. I want to. I want you to come away with the how targets looks and feels when you're actually using it, and to to come away and and ready to apply this to your own projects. This is more more immersive than an exposure type thing. So I'll give you another 15 minutes to work on this. I know we're coming up on the hour pretty quickly, but we'll we'll take 15 minutes. Try this out yourself, and then we'll take our last 10-minute break after that. So in this notebook on the on three dash changes, the, the idea is to start with a fully specified pipeline and then and then do some experimentation like you would in an ordinary situation, changing code, changing data, changing commands, and then and then experiencing how targets reacts and where it tries to save time and and how it automatically detects things that need to be need to rerun. And so we begin with a, a fully specified pipeline. When we run tar make, we start with churn file and end with best model, not because any of the ordering of the targets in this pipeline. Um, and in fact, we could have we could have reversed some of the order here. But because but because of the order in the graph, that churn data is prior to all, a bunch of other targets, including best model, and that's how that's how the execution order is result is resolved. 
and when we and like and like you experienced, we can load models from the data store. In this case, we have a trained Keras model. If we run tar make again, everything's up to date because none of our code or data or or any of those dependencies changed. I could even restart the session. And as was mentioned before, a great question from Annie, everything will still be up to date because targets tries not to rely on what's in this session. There's this, there's this ex external process that's created just for the purpose of running the pipeline. And so you can have objects in your session. You can do your own exploratory data analysis to figure out what you should be running next, what you should implement next, and have that not break the pipeline. If you change the data, like I said before, there's this format equal to file target for the data. And that means this there's a physical file locally that's tracked for changes. And if we change that file, if we go into data and we delete we delete one of the rows of data here and we run tar make again, then targets automatically knows that this file changed. And so it needs to reprocess the file. And then that changes the content of the data, which changes the pre-processing and so on down through our entire pipeline. And all that reruns because everything, because this, this keystone target that everything depends on has changed now. And so while that's rerunning, the targets package also, also reacts to changes in the code in, in the commands of your target definitions. So if we go to the targets.r file, we change this r bind statement here and the best run target to the more recommended bind rows function from dplyr, then as long as we save this file correctly, that's going to invalidate that's going to invalidate one of our targets. It's going to say, okay, best run is no longer up to date. So we should no longer trust what's in best model. The interesting thing though, is that if you run tar make, yes, it's going to rerun that best run target because the command changes, but it skips best model. And the reason is the return value of best run didn't change at all. And so best model is actually still up to date, even though it's, it's one of its dependencies reran. And likewise, if you change a function, so if we open the functions file in three dash changes, and we go to define model, if we change the definition of a model, for example, we change the, the, this dropout layer, and we save that file, targets automatically knows that some upstream code that your models depend on changed. And so that will actually rerun all the models again. And as I'll demonstrate last, the way that targets tracks non-trivial changes, for example, this, this value that I just changed, that, that immediately propagates downstream, but there is a pre-processing step where this function is actually deparsed before it's before it's hashed. And the upshot of that is that that if you format white space differently, if you format comments differently, none of that's actually going to matter. Um, so if we add a blank space here, we add a comment, then this change that I just did right now, isn't actually going to invalidate anything because it's not going to change the answer that the function gives. It's just, it's just formatting that all goes away anyway. And this is actually one of the major advantages of targets over a language agnostic tool that just 
tracks the timestamps and maybe hashes of script files because it's there's a lot that can that you can do when you know the language that you're working with you can rely on the fact that we're working in our code in our functions and so we can translate that knowledge to make better decisions about what to run and what to skip so that's that's this set of exercises and hopefully that that gave you more of a flavor of what it's like to use targets and how it can help your your own projects any questions at this point All right, let's go on to the next exercise. As soon as you've built up a, a pipeline and added some, some you know, made some changes, experimented a bit, sooner or later, you're going to encounter errors. It's, and and um, it's a bit harder to deal with errors in a pipeline when a, in a pipeline than it is when you're doing an exploratory data analysis, because for debugging, you want things to run quickly and interactively and to be able to isolate the problem in, and be able to have full control of, of your environment. In targets, nothing is under manual control after you let the, the pipeline go. It's, it's fully automated and it's not even in your, your R session anymore. That's, it's in a, a, an external process. So, so it's, it's a bit hard to get to, but there are workarounds and techniques that you can use to debug even, even pipelines and, and to get to the, the heart of an error um, and resolve it. That's what this 4 dash debugging chapter is all about. So um, we're going to create a brand new project with a brand new targets file that you can create when you, when you uh, run this code chunk. And then if you if you run tar edit, you'll see there you have this new targets file with, with a new function script from the, the accompanying folder for this chapter. And the problem is that this pipeline has a bug. It starts off just fine, but sooner or later, it encounters an error. It's, it's loading, yeah. So, and you may have seen an error like this before where it can't allocate enough memory. Um, that's not necessarily the problem here, but uh, your, uh, your, your goal for this notebook is to figure out where the error is and solve it and run the, run the pipeline um, error-free. Uh, so you've got some tools right away to, to locate this error, even if you don't remember it. So uh, there's this message in the console. If the console message goes away, you can visualize the graph and see the target that errored out in red. You can also explore the metadata and you can, you can select the, the, the targets that you want and show their error messages and warnings. But even that isn't enough sometimes. We want a serious way to create an, an interactive environment where we can go in and figure out where the error is. So what we're gonna do is uh, there, there are a couple different ways to, to attack this. There are a couple different built-in techniques in the, in the targets manual that'll, that'll walk through some of this. We're going to use workspaces to start off with. So, so the first thing you'll do is, and this is, this is actually a bit, uh, um, something I actually should update in the, in the, uh, next, next few, um, workshops, but you're going to, you're going to say, um, in the targets pipeline options, you're going to write uh, workspace on error equal to true. I'm going to stick that in the chat because it's a bit of outdated code. The, the workshop materials are a bit outdated for, for this. So I'm going to write the correct thing to insert in the, in the chat. So you would stick this in the options part of your target script here. And next time you run tar make, you're going to have a workspace file that will let you set up the, an interactive environment where you can debug things. So 
these workspace files are saved in the target's data store. And we have one here. To load a workspace, you'll just use the tar workspace function in the name of that target that has one. And so if we keep an eye in this environment tab in the RStudio IDE, you'll see that loading the workspace loads the loads all the functions that you'll that you'll need in order to to run this target interactively. Um, that's those are just loaded by sourcing the target script, and then you'll have objects like churn data and churn recipe, which are useful for um, for for actually running the target's command. And so with with all that data loaded and functions loaded, you can actually you can actually repeat this command interactively, this command that that was supposed to run correctly within a target. You can run that interactively and you get the same error. So great. So we've taken a a an error that only that, that happened in the pipeline. We've now taken it outside the pipeline to reproduce. And this actually makes it a lot easier to debug. And so one way to do this is with the with the debug and debug once functions in, in R. So these functions, if you're in an interactive session, let you let you go through and and uh, step through this function in a much more much friendlier way. So instead of just going right to the error, you can keep going bit by bit until you get right up to where the error is. So I'm going to say debug once test model, and then I'm going to run this command again. And execution is paused right at the beginning of this function. And what I can do is press the letter N in the console, and that will advance me to the next part in the model. And I can step through other functions as well here. So I can say, I can say debug once train model. And then when I hit next, I can go through and and now I'm inside this train model function, which was nested inside uh, the the test run function, I believe it was. And I can I can press the letter N to keep going, and you can do this until you find the error. And once you found the error, you can edit this functions file and and fix the error and be on your way. So that's how workspaces get get and targets get you to a point where you can have something to interactively debug, and then go through interactive debugging best practices to find out where the error is. So let's take 10 minutes to work on, on, this, uh, on this piece, on this chapter. Uh, create a workspace of your own by, by setting the workspace on error option to true, and then go through and, and do some interactive debugging, see if you can find the error and fix it. So I will put, I'll put 10 minutes on. Um, would like, let's go back to this exercise on debugging. So we stopped by, hopefully you had a chance to set up, to reproduce the error on your end and then get to the root of it. So like I described before, we have a workspace file to do this. Let's start debugging. So I'm going to say debug once, test model. Thanks to the workspace, we have churn data and churn recipe and the test model function loaded in our environment. And when we run it, we immediately get to step through. So uh, I, if, I, if I press the letter C in my, um, and enter that in the console, it would go all the way through to the end or to, the, to an error. But if I press N, that'll just advance us forward one step. Next is the train model function. I'm going to go ahead and debug that too. Debug once train model. Hit N to advance. And as I go through, I'm about to run define model now. I want to debug define model. You don't have to do this for every single function, but maybe maybe as you've as you've realized, the error is somewhere in define model. And then we want to hit next. I can advance through the body of define model. And here I get to the point where there is this error. And 
I know I artificially inserted a stop statement to create an error for everyone to find, but in real life, you would either hit this error uh, when you advance further and further, or you would um, you you would inspect the, this part of the code, realize that something's wrong, and, and then fix it. So if I hit next, run that model, of course, it's going to run this stop statement, which produces the error. If I just simply remove that, that is going to fix the error. If I run tar make, then that'll run that model, and that error will go away. Now I went over workspaces, and there's another way to debug pipelines, and that is based on based on selecting target, certain targets to interactively debug. So instead of workspace on error equal to true, one thing you could do is say debug debug equal to a character vector with the, with the names of the targets that you want to debug, in this case, run. And next time I call tar make, it'll, it'll try to, to launch you into the runtime environment of this target and then stop. So, and then pause and wait for, for, for you. And it's, it's exactly like that interactive debugging environment that I showed you. The only snag is you have to say caller function equal to null so that you are in, so that you are, the pipeline runs in the current session where you have interactivity already. So you have to, you have to disable that reproducible external R process that I mentioned before. Before you do that, just, just to prevent breaking your pipeline, I highly recommend restarting your session first. And you can either quit out of R and launch it again, or you can go to session, restart R. And there's this, this uh, keyboard shortcut in order to do that quickly that I just used. So if I say library targets, and then I run that tar make call, then as soon as it's loading out of packages and gets ready, we're in the browser statement. We're in an interactive debugging session right inside this target now. And so we have churn data and churn recipe in our environment here. That's it's because we're, we're in the middle of this execution environment. If I said debug once, test model, and hit the letter N, we'd be inside this function all over again. The difference between the workspaces approach and this one is that here you are actively running the pipeline already. You are in the middle of a pipeline instead of a separate interactive session outside the pipeline. And usually workspaces are better, but with this option that I'm showing now, the, the major advantage is that you can just advance into where the target is executing without having to populate a bunch of function arguments or just reconstruct the target's command uh, right away. You, it's, it's, sometimes it's a bit easier to get right to what's going on. All right, and I think that that's all the time that I think we have for exercises. There are a couple more things that I'm gonna go over really quickly, just other features in targets and other things to be aware of. What I was planning to do next is go into this five dash files notebook, but I'll do I'll hit some of the highlights interactively. This is this is uh, this is a set of exercises that teaches you how to interact with input files and reproducibly track output files, and R markdown reports. So as I mentioned before, you can have an R markdown report that is actually an artifact of the pipeline and depending on upstream targets. So uh, what I'll do first. I will run this pipeline to make sure that everything the report needs is up to date. And then I will create, as soon as that's done, I will create this, this report file uh, that, we'll, that we'll get to explore. So it's this, uh, these models will have to run first uh, to, to get set up. I, uh, did a completely new session.
But once that's done, we'll have All right, so we have this, we have this R Markdown report and we can run it interactively using the knit button in our studio. All it's doing is just loading some of the models and reporting the results. And the cool thing is about targets is that you can add this, this, this target that actually runs the pipeline, uh, that, runs, that runs the report as part of the pipeline. So you can say tar edit, um, then you can add this tar render step. And the cool thing about this is that this report automatically Oh, I forgot to save the script. This is the graph that you got, you would get before the report. As soon as I save this target script, run the new graph. We have to run, I have to load the target types package. This report step is a new target it's going to run the report and it automatically depends on a couple of our previous models. And it depends on a couple of our previous models because of this, this tar read and tar load here. And that's, this serves two purposes. One, to let targets crawl through the code in the report and automatically situate the actual report target in, in a place where it depends on the correct upstream code and data. And also it just lets you with the completed pipeline run the report on its own. And these, these reports are really nice for, for having something polished and crisp to share with your colleagues and also that's kept up to date automatically. Now, this is one way to interact with our markdown. Another way is to have targets, to have our markdown as the overall, as the overall overarching workflow engine of a targets workflow. There's actually a way to, and actually an R Markdown interface for everything that you would do in targets. And it's called Target Markdown. And there is a, there's a, there's a chapter in the user manual that, that goes through this. I don't have time to go through it now, but if you like to write everything in R Markdown reports, there's a link to the, to the, to this page where, where it has um, where it has a, a walkthrough of how to use R Markdown as an interface for two targets itself. That there's a there's a special targets language engine here where instead of writing R code chunks, you, you will write code chunks that begin with with targets. Uh, there's a special targets language engine. It's actually part of the knitter package now. Um, and this, this can be used to do some pretty powerful stuff. I mean, here's, here's an example that I was able to disclose publicly for, for a conference. So we use uh, target markdown and stand targets to develop complicated models in the life sciences and run simulation studies to validate them. And this is a, this is a really nice combination of this, this report that I'm showing on the screen now is a really nice combination of target markdown and stand targets for the pipelines that validate Bayesian models. And this is a very common model in the life sciences in, in clinical trials specifically. And we have a model of some stand code and, uh, and the, this workflow, which is walk, which you walk through line by line, uh, put chunk by chunk here, uh, runs and uh, tests the calibration of this model, the correctness of the implementation. Um, that's a real world life sciences scaled up use case, a bit far for, for pedagogical purposes today, but this, this is used to tackle some serious stuff with some serious scale. Um, last thing I'll say is that targets is part of an ecosystem. So I mentioned the stand targets package. There is this, there's this ecosystem of packages that I'm calling the Targetopia which is a bunch of interfaces to make targets easier to use for these specialized cases like Bayesian data analysis, like reporting, 
And there are a bunch of you know, these packages, a lot of them geared, some of them, well, there aren't very many of them at all, but some of them geared towards the life sciences. I mean, there's a lot of Bayesian modeling and, and Jags and Stan at, at work. And, and these two packages make it super easy to use uh, targets to run and simulate and to run, to run Jags and Stan models as part of uh, larger pipelines, whether it's single analyses or simulation studies. NL Mixar is a, is a new one that came up, but Bill, Bill Denny just started to develop this one. And it's, it's uh, and it does PKPD using a very well-known uh, package called NL Mixar to, to do that. And so targets is, is very extensible. But it's this, um, this website ex explains um, how to, I mean, what's, what's here right now to go to contributing there, there are directions on how to write a package and how uh, with, with that, that extends targets under this umbrella target factories is the, is the main idea here. You write a, a function that abstracts away a lot of the, a lot of the difficulties of, of, and a lot of the, a lot of the, the minutia that, that may be required to create individual targets, um, to create helpers, to, to really smooth out the process of, of specifying pipelines. Um, all right, so with that, I would, uh, I'll just say that thank you, thank you everyone for coming. This is, I hope you've gotten a lot out of this, this workshop and came away with some familiarity and tools at your fingertips to go forth and apply to your, to your own projects. And for the remaining time, I'll take questions and revisit things, um, whatever you'd like. I just wanted to extend um, my thanks for running a, an absolutely fantastic session. I mean, it's, this is such an amazingly important package for a lot of the work that I think all of us do that um, it's well worth getting to grips with and starting to use it. And yeah, once again, thank you for all of your time and effort in building and developing this. And thank you for running this workshop today. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. This is I, I really appreciate this platform just to spread these ideas and help people where they're struggling and may not know they're struggling. And uh, yeah, feel very welcome. And, and, and the, the infrastructure management is, has been amazing. I, there's, uh, there's been very little I've had to, to worry about here. So um, very thanks. Very uh, thank you very much for the, for the, for the welcome, for the opportunity to, to come speak and um, I've had a great time. Thank you very much. Can I ask a question before we of course. go? Um, very quickly. Uh, is it possible to have two target pipelines in a project or do we have to have one per project? Yeah, that's tricky because in a typical targets workflow, you have, you have one file called targets.r and you have one data store, which is called underscore targets and to have multiple, multiple uh, projects in the same folder like that, multiple pipelines in the same in the same file space, may get tricky. And I've this is something that many people have asked for, and I've developed some things to to help. There is this chapter in the manual that describes managing multiple projects. I'll stick that in the Zoom chat. And how this works is there is this targets.yaml file at the high level, which allows you to specify which project you're in. And so you can have something like a targets.yaml file to, to either switch from project A to project B based on different target scripts and different projects can have a different target script in a different data store. And what the inside of a target's YAML file looks like this, you can choose between projects. Each project has its own collection of settings. This is all managed by the config package. Well, no, no I, I got away from the config package. It borrows from the idea of the config package, which has similar functionality for different sets of purposes. And then there are some environment variables that you can use to set the project that you're in or the, the targets, um, I believe you can set the targets YAML file. I forget if I actually implemented that. I'm pretty sure I did. 
uh, it's been a while since I, since I uh, implemented this though, back in the summer. Um, but yeah, that'll allow you to have uh, multiple projects in the same file space. And even you can even have interdependent projects that, in, that inherit each other's settings as well. So if um, you can have project B inheriting some settings from project A, and you can have more settings that aren't just the, the, the script in the store. Mm. And um, yeah, all this is designed to, to make that a bit, a bit easier. What do you mean by inheriting properties from another project? So if project B inherits from project A, then project yeah. B gets, gets this setting, for example, the, the reporter, the, what's called the reporter, how, uh, how messages are displayed to the console uh, is set to a particular value here. And project B will inherit that value from, from project A. If, if, you, if you say inherits project A, and it inherits anything that is um, after reporter make? Yeah, so it inherits, it, it just gets for free all the settings that aren't already defined in project B, so. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a question. question. Oh, go, go for it, sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, so I've, I've got a question here that you, in that um, targets YAML, you can set the, the store where to, um, you know, the, the, replacing that underscore targets folder. Um, so one of the things that you want to try and get away with, with um, our projects is storing your R code on a network share that you're all in a team working off. You want to use Git and each have your own copies locally, so you're not like accidentally overwriting files and change code and this that and the other. Um, but presumably you could set the store there to some network location that is shared. And are there any particular reasons that you shouldn't do that? Performance. Yeah. I've before. had <laughs> users come to me with, with projects that run slowly because they're forced to use a Windows mounted network drive and Targets is not designed for that because it's designed to have frequent back and forth communication with the metadata file in that store. And, you know, for, for other reasons, I would much prefer not to separate out that metadata file. That would kind of, that would break a lot of the assumptions of the design. And it's not really a, that common use case nor, nor encourage because it's, it would make the abstraction a bit leaky if I were to break that apart. Um, but yeah, if it, if the, the the entire data store is is far away on a network from the actual pipeline that's running, that does cause problems, and it causes some race conditions too, because targets is constantly writing lines to that metadata store, and and the network lag can create situations where pieces of different lines are are written at the same time and they get mangled. Um, so I yeah I would I would. Uh, I would not recommend uh, putting putting that on a on a file share. I think that, um, I mean, if everybody did that, there would I'd probably have to separate the metadata file from the rest of the store, and that would be that would be be fine. But I think most most computing systems are getting away from that Windows network share uh, idea, and and this is we wait a few years, and it will become less and less of a problem. Yeah, I'm thinking of more actually uh, instead of like a an SMB share, perhaps using something like um, OneDrive or Dropbox, where you've got a folder that is still your local disk that it's writing to, but then it's asynchronously synchronizing back to a cloud system. You, you could run into issues, I guess, where both of you are working together and it will not know which file is the, the right one. Um, you know, who, who's committed the right file, but um, mm -hmm. yes. That can work a bit better. It still gets somewhat tricky because to just for the sake of being reliable and safe, what targets sometimes, what targets does is it writes, it writes the data to a temporary file and then renames that file to its permanent location. That might confuse Dropbox a little bit as a pipeline is running with such frequent changes to the data store as targets are being built. So 
but that could probably be easily avoided if you turn off Dropbox sync while the pipeline is running and then turn it back on again when you're done. That could probably avoid most of those issues. Um, and I actually, one of the motivating reasons of the changes to the data store that I made in targets versus Drake is because of that file store issue. Drake had it really bad because there was, because of the, the, the third party package that I chose to manage storage internally, there were a lot of small cryptically named files created in the data store. It was a, it was a key value store and it was, and we had all sorts of Dropbox issues. By reducing the number of files and making, giving them human readable names and putting all the metadata in one file, I think that, I think that that should resolve most of the previous Dropbox uh, and OneDrive friction. Would still recommend uh, turning on sync and uh, you know only after the pipeline is done for a particular run though. That's great. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And I hope there's no more questions. Um, just once again, thank Will for this excellent session. Um, thank you all for staying with us. Um, please do fill in that evaluation form if you um, can, that'd be much appreciated. And yeah, have a good rest of the evening and um, afternoon for you, Will. Yeah, you too. Thanks for, thanks for the support and thanks for attending.